Welcome to the Memories of a Moonbird podcast, exploring life one story at a time. Hello, friends. I'm Daniel Sherl. Today on the show, she's one of the most passionate, smart, and inspiring women you'll ever meet. Through her social media platform called Astro Athens, she advocates for science and the arts and teaches astrophysics in a fun way that makes it enjoyable for everyone. Her background is in stellar and planetary formations, protoplanetary disks, and exoplanetary systems, and in addition to bringing outer space down to Earth, she's also a social media influencer and an international model who's traveled the world. She says, if sharing my story might inspire just one person who may feel torn, stuck, or fearful to pursue a life of uncertainty or an unconditional career path, then I feel as though I've begun to make a difference in the future of innovative creators. Please welcome the awesome Athena Brensberger. Athena, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks so much. Yeah, really happy to be here, Daniel. It's great to have <laughs> you here. So let's jump right in. Where were you born and raised? Brooklyn, represent. So <laughs> Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> born and raised. Nice. My dad was actually from Brooklyn, so woohoo. Uh, tell me, what was little Athena like as a child? Creative uh, artist, dancer. Um, I didn't really fall in love with uh, astronomy until I was about 12 years old. So up until 12 um, was, yeah, just really outgoing and energetic. I'm still kind of energetic. Um, <laughs> and then I would just say bubbly. <laughs> okay. So I have to ask the name Athena, as we all know, Greek mythology associated with wisdom and handicraft and uh, classical learning. Do you have siblings named Apollo and Dionysus or is this a soul thing? <laughs> I actually love that you asked that because that's sort of a, like a, a passion of mine is, are the names Apollo and Artemis. Um, but no, actually I do have siblings though that are Aaron. Um, and then Arwen, like the Lord of the Rings warrior Very princess. Cool. So yeah, yeah. So I guess that's kind of running in the family. And we've established immediately that your parents are very cool. They are. <laughs> <laughs> they really are. <laughs> Have you ever actually been to Athens? Um, I actually haven't. No, just virtually, I guess. That's why I, I took a moment to think, well, have I? Uh, haven't been there officially in person. Not yet. <laughs> I'm curious, you said when you were a kid, there were other things going on about 12, you fell in love with astronomy. How did all that happen? And, and what's the story of how you came into all this? Yeah. Um, so I got a book that were uh, had a bunch of images, pictures taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Mm. Um, but I didn't really know what it was at, at first. I kind of just was like flipping through the pages, looking at pictures like a 12 year old would. And um, like I mentioned, I was an artist back then. So I thought these were all paintings and like illustrations. And so I thought it was just a bunch of like artwork. And it realized that there was like kind of something like way beyond out there. And a friend of mine told me like, no, these are things called galaxies and nebulae. And there's probably billions of stars and potential planets that might be like earth. Mm. And there might possibly be life there out there. And I just like 12 year old mind explosion was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> I have to go into this as a career. Well, then all through high school and stuff, were you a science nerd that was just trying to tell everybody how cool the universe is? Not really, actually. I was, I've always loved it, but I wasn't kind of like a, I guess, I mean, I was always sort of talking to people about it, like telling them how cool it was, but I wasn't. I guess so much in like that kind of nerd category. Cause I, I, and the reason I say that is just because I really struggled at math. I really kind of struggled in the other sciences. Mm. And so like, I, a lot of times was the, was a student who had to get like extra tutoring or after school programs. I get like a lot of extra help with this stuff, but I just loved it so much that I kept pushing through it. Uh, and at the same time, I was pursuing a dance career and a music career. And I was like really doing a lot with the theater. And so it was like this funny mix between like the theater kids and then like the total space nerds. Um, <laughs> and so it was kind of like that for a very, very long time. And coincidentally, my high school, which was actually Edward R. Murrow High School in Brooklyn, what up Brooklyn? It ended up being like the only high school in, I think all of New York City that had a planetarium in it. And I didn't know that. Mm. I only got to the school because I got in through an audition um, for singing. And I was like, wow, what are the chances? And so that's when I started really pursuing, okay, I could actually do astronomy as a career one day, learn how to track asteroids at 16 and like did all this cool stuff. Mm. And then it was a similar story for college. Um, when I went to the College of Staten Island and a crazy experience of how I ended up going to that school and it was like college application process. It totally messed it up. And long story short, ended <laughs> up going to CSI and it was the only CUNY school, so City University of New York, that had an observatory and an astrophysics department. And I was like, what are the chances of this? A huge observatory. Yeah, the universe it's, it's was trying city. to push you into this path, right? Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Legit. So I was like, oh, this is great. So, uh, and, then, and then that's what like started with, with my research in undergrad. Um, 
And then in the middle of that is when I, I ended up getting scouted and modeling and, and decided to kind of test out that career path. And yeah, so well, we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah. And I have to tell you something <laughs> kind of funny, actually. A lot of people in life will say things like, oh, I have a dream of owning, you know, like a Lamborghini, or if I ever built my dream house, it would have uh, and always just very stereotypical responses. And people ask me, they go, well, what do you want in your house? And without skipping a beat, I always go a planetarium. <laughs> I love that. That would just be so uh, yeah, great. So, that's, that's like major goals. Well, it's funny. I have a friend from Buffalo, actually, who's an astronomy educator, and he does the planetarium shows in Buffalo and stuff. And he and I were just chatting on the show last season, and he was tell- we were talking about the advance in technology between – because I'm 49, and when I was a kid, you know, you had – these um the old spider looking planetary projectors that, yeah yeah and now they're all crazy Digital. technology it's really yeah it's super yeah. cool it's i know really cool. yeah when i was uh, 16 in high school that's what our planetarium in brooklyn was and so i started learning um like i, I was like spending so many days in that planetarium like after school and stuff like that kind of just learning the fiber optic system and so i had learned this whole system and by the time I graduated high school, I like found out that they had put in an entire digital system. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'd have to learn all over again. Um, but it's actually easier because it's all through the computer now, which, yeah. you know, and, and it's sharper. And, you know, if all the light bulbs goes out, you don't have to worry about like all of a sudden, like, you know, Beetlejuice is missing yes, from the Mars. Orion constellation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what's going on? Oh my gosh, we go supernova, you know, so, <laughs> which it's will hilarious. happen in our lifetime which would be beautiful. It'd be brighter than the moon whenever that happens. Beetlejuice? Yeah. So, so Beetlejuice is a red giant star. And um, right now it, it, it just kind of like reached the time frame in which it may go supernova. So it's possible it can happen while we're still alive or it can happen uh. like in the next like hundred thousand years. But the, um, the time frame in which this type of star would die it, it just entered that. So it, and it started dimming and brightening, which astronomers later realized it, likely doesn't have to do with it getting ready to explode. It may have to do with some type of temperature fluctuation. But the point is, if it happens, which it possibly can, it's going to be so bright. We'll literally see a supernova in the night sky during the day too. Like it would be, it would be different during the day, but it would be about the brightness of the full moon. I have a question about this because for people who don't know, they're listening to the show, light takes a great deal of time to travel across the universe. So when we're looking at Betelgeuse through a telescope, we're actually seeing it thousands of years ago. So are we saying now that even though it may go supernova in our lifetime, it already has gone yes. supernova? Correct. Correct. And so if we see it like tonight or tomorrow, that it means it, it did it like, I forgot how far away, how many light years Betelgeuse is from Earth, but it would be that many light years or that many years in the past. By the way, light year is really just a metric of distance. So it's like saying moving at the speed of light, it would take you about one year to get to one distance. And a, a kind of a an understanding of like of the speed of light, it's about 300 million meters per second. And a good understanding of that is wherever your doorknob is, that's about a meter. So imagine traveling 300 million of those in one second, that's the speed of light. Um, and, so, and so something that's a light year away is if you're traveling that fast, it would take you a year to get there. Man, it's just mind boggling. It's so cool. Well, let's talk about Astro Athens. How did you start it? What's your long-term goal with it? And what was the inspiration for it? So what inspired me for the name was I got scouted for America's Next Top Model while I was pursuing astrophysics uh, research at, at the Hayden Planetarium in New York. And, and they were like, if you should audition, whatever. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. I was like, modeling is like superficial, like, uh. And my mentors, of all people, my astrophysics mentors were like, you should do it. Why not? explore yeah, the creativity and like astronomy astronomers are some of the most I think like open-minded individuals I've like ever met my entire life and I mean my my mentor also was pursuing musical theater and then I had a chance to meet Neil deGrasse Tyson a few times like he pursued dance and captain of his wrestling team while doing astrophysics anyway mm. point is I decided to go ahead and give it a shot and um from that they were like we you know twitter was really trending they're like you should make a tweet a twitter page that's when i made astro athens because i wanted to keep the astronomy in there and then ever since then i I decided not to go through with the show after getting to like the final round and everything like that of being chosen for the top 12 i was like i'm not gonna do it i decided to instead start creating like a social media which was initially for modeling um like as i started signing with agencies 
And I thought, hmm, I'm getting a lot of like attention from the fashion industry. What if I take this opportunity to teach the fashion industry about space science and why rockets yeah. and astrophysics is cool? So that was initially the plan. And, and it just sort of grew from there. This, this was about five years ago. If I had $10 million and I looked at you and said, Athena, I want to back your dream project, what would it be? That is such a good question. Um, I would say it's probably what I'm building right now called Space Globe. And it's really kind of just uh, a 3D function on my website, which is of uh, a globe. So it's of Earth. And it has all the different space events around the world that are happening. But initially, that's kind of what it is right now. But I want it to grow into a full-on application where you could start to explore the cosmos mm. um, and also to um, meet with people, like un like talk with people and connect with people in the space community that are either hosting events or going to events um, because there's a lot out there, but a lot of people don't know about it unless you're yeah. in the niche of astrophysics or even kind of just science in general. And so I want, I want to really almost like turn it inside out and make it open to like everybody else that's in all in their industries. So a lot of people find this to be interesting. They just don't have the information. There's a lack of almost promotion behind it. So for if I had $10 million to fuel this project, I would do that in an instant. Yeah, what you're saying is actually so important because even with, um, like in Los Angeles, uh, they have star parties at Griffith Park where yeah. the public can just come and look through a telescope. But there's no like one go-to resource. Yeah. But that's the thing is that unless you know to look up these places, there's really no like one go-to resource for knowing that it's happening. And because of like just how much I've like really just sort of seeing like the audience growth that I've experienced just by my, my own brands. Like, I feel like that would just be such a, a, a wonderful opportunity to create. So let me ask you, what is your, what are your least and, and uh, most favorite parts of your job? Let me see. Well, my most favorite parts are connecting to people. I absolutely love, love connecting to them. And I don't mean just like finding out about somebody and then talking to them on social media. I mean, like actually seeing something click when, I, when we're talking about it, like a certain theory in space or something like that. And then seeing that moment that I experienced when I was 12 years old, mm. um, like this mind blown moment. And I think that that's just so astonishing because it really takes you kind of, this might sound like kind of crazy, like whoop do doo but it takes you out of your body for a moment. You know, it takes you not like literally, but it actually makes you feel like, wow, there's so much more out there. I mean, it's the cosmos is literally called the expanse for a reason. Like there's just such a different perspective when you actually start to just separate yourself from this earth and this planet and the, the government, the economics, everything we've built around us, the industry. And you start to look at what things really are really on a fundamental level, which is like us biological beings living on this like extraordinary rock that has an atmosphere and water and we're in space. And as of right now, like we're the only ones that we know exist. So my least favorite part, I would say, I mean, I, this is usually, I guess my answer is editing the stuff <laughs> I make because, yeah, yeah. because it was a huge learning curve for me. I have shot so many videos that I still have not edited. Well, let's talk about aliens. I'm actually curious. Do you think we're going to find proof of extraterrestrial life or be contacted by aliens in your lifetime? I don't know about being contacted by them, but I do feel like we might find some type of like microbe um, some type of like extremophiles, like a small, like microscopic organism, possibly on Mars. Yeah, possibly like microscopic life, uh, either on Mars or even beyond that to like some of the icy moons of Saturn and Jupiter. So like Enceladus and Europa, I think are like really probable locations where we might actually find like some type of possibly space fish. I mean, Enceladus has um, these plumes of icy water that's shot out from its South Pole. And right around that are hydrothermal vents, which we find right here on Earth in the water where there's like a, this like disruption between, I think it's sulfuric acid and then like the water and it's causing a boiling effect. And so it's really, really hot and everything around it is icy. And right around that region on Earth, there are, you know, types of bacteria that can survive under those conditions. Mm -hmm. So who's to say that that's not the case also possibly on Enceladus? Now, what about intelligent life like you see in the movies where, you know, you have an alien with another spaceship or whatever? Uh, there's also Contact, the movie, which, which showed, so you know. Yeah. So did you read the book, actually? Yeah, I actually movie. have it right here. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah, it's right on like, my shelf <laughs> over here. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, well, do you think that eventually, well, first of all, do you think it's possible that intelligent alien life has already been to Earth or do you think it has not? I don't know about already I've been to Earth. I feel like it, it hasn't. 
unless there's like some crazy discovery we end up finding that like earthlings ourselves like humans are actually like possibly from another rocky planet of some sort or, or we're from mars before mars completely lost its atmosphere and electromagnetic field and we maybe migrated to earth and maybe we're the aliens but but um which is that would be following you know the potential of panspermia which would say that like some type of space rock collided with earth and was carrying microbes on it that eventually created life here on earth as we know it um because earth had the right conditions but it's so it's it's possible but i i feel like as far as like while humans have been around if some type of an intel like intelligent species have visited i don't i don't feel like it just because i don't i mean i don't know it's it's really hard to kind of say like i i just think that like if it did happen to have that be like the largest kept secret i think would be pretty astonishing especially with seeing how there's been rivalries with nations if say one nation was keeping it a secret i feel like another nation that was like possibly not an ally at the time or like an enemy would have mo- probably totally spilled the beans. Mm. I mean, that's kind of my, that's also like my view as far as like the moon landing and stuff like that. It's like, if that was, if that was fixed, like France would have definitely called us out. The Soviet Union definitely would have called us out for sure. Like, you know, decades ago. Um, and, and yeah, so, look, people, people who think that the moon landing was faked are also the people that think the earth is flat. So, you true. know, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, so yeah, so I, I don't, I feel like we, there hasn't probably been a visit before, but I don't outrule the possibility of, of it existing you know just yeah with the amount of exoplanets that have kind of been discovered more and more recently and for those that don't know exoplanets are planets outside of our solar system correct yes exactly yeah wanted to make sure i had my brain on right yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> can you off the top of your head come up with an, an analogy to explain to the listeners how vast space is and I'm, the reason i ask is because what people don't understand is they look up at the night sky and they see billions and billions of stars and they think well if there were aliens why haven't they already come here But I try to explain to them that the distances between the stars are so incredibly vast that unless they have space folding technology or travel through black holes or whatever things we haven't even discovered yet, the space would be enormous to try and find us in the gal in the universe. Yeah. So and it's also expanding, which is something to keep in mind. So Edwin P. Hubble came up with the Hubble constant, which essentially, and the Hubble's law, which essentially is able to calculate how much our universe is expanding every single day. And it's essentially on a unit of like double the amount every single Earth day, essentially. So pretty much every night you go to sleep, the universe is expanding twice in size. Things are moving further away from you, except for the things like Andromeda, for instance, is eventually going to collide with the Milky Way galaxy one day. The two galaxies will will collide because they're being gravitationally drawn to each other. But despite that, everything else is expanding exponentially, like every single day. And so the universe Wait, do is we getting know, bigger. Do we know why and do we know where the center of the expansion is? So the center is an interesting thing because the center is essentially every single part of the universe, which is probably a hard concept to understand. But pretty much it's because everything is pushing away from everything else on the same scale. So what this means is if I'm here and you're like, so you're in Los Angeles, you're expanding away from me based on the distance to Los Angeles. But somebody from, so if I was to say like my place now and let's go like past Los Angeles to- um, Hawaii. Yeah, to, to Hawaii. They would be moving away from me further at a faster rate than you're moving away from me because they're further away. And so that's one thing is that they're not grabbing till she bound anymore. The other thing is- dark energy, which is a current theory that talks, that is essentially explaining why the universe is expanding. And dark energy is pushing apart the universe. It's an opposing force of dark matter, which is, has, it has a mass, it has a gravitational effect on space time. So it's like an inward force. And so that's what allows essentially the universe to not just completely go and like just completely inflate and and get blown apart. Hmm. There's still this, this hold of yeah of like a, of an internal pull and this is what dark matter would be so there's there's this contradiction but the thing is most of the universe right now the theory stands is made up of dark energy then followed by dark matter and then followed by everything else like you me the stars the planet physical illuminated matter we're a very small percent we're about five percent of what the whole universe is made up of but if multiple things are moving away from each other wouldn't they eventually collide into each other some things collide yeah so some things are, are colliding into each other. So for instance, 
Andromeda, the Andromeda galaxy, and the Milky Way galaxy, because they're within a specific distance from one another, where their gravitational effect is interacting with each other, it's affecting one another, they're getting pulled in. Andromeda is a lot bigger than the Milky Way. So Andromeda is eventually going to completely engulf the Milky Way, and then they'll do this sort of spiral dance and eventually kind of become one galaxy in like a union. It's kind of beautiful when you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yes, there are things that are colliding, even black holes, which led to the discovery of the intermediate black hole, which is like an in-between black hole. So, but basically when you watch like in a movie and there's some big sporting event and then suddenly an explosion goes off and everybody in the stadium freaks out and runs a thousand different directions. That's pretty much what's happening to the universe right now. That is such a great explanation. Essentially. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. So the explosion would be essentially like where the big bang model is, is, you know, uh, where where it's playing its role, the big bang theory believes, um, or it's defending the fact that there was an explosion. Essentially that kind of happened a moment, a moment of singular, not really explosion, but a moment of singular, where things started to expand. And so, yes, that would be like you said, in a stadium, if an explosion happened, everyone scattered away from each other, away from the center, away from everything else. Do you ever feel like you have a day where you just, you feel the universe expanding around you and you're like, <laughs> oh, the weight of it all. Not really. <laughs> No, Good. I can't really. Uh, and, and I think 40s. that's that's the problem. <laughs> oh, until your forties. Listen, that's kind of, I guess, the, the problem of being so confined to our planet, being so small on, on in the perspective of the universe, is we can't feel something like that. We can't really notice it. I mean, maybe if you're like a really deep meditation and you're kind of like take me to the universe, like you know, maybe you can like visualize it or something, but. It's really, that's why it's really tough, I think, for a lot of people to have the cosmic perspective and to see each other as, as truly fundamentally the same, the same biological beings. Yes. And you bring up an incredibly beautiful and important point, which is, I think it's actually hard to have grown up, like my parents, very intellectual. Um, you know, I grew up loving astronomy and science, and I'm very passionate about them and the arts, of course. And when you grow up with this kind of awareness at 12 years old, you're watching cosmos and you're, you're understanding how the universe works and your place is so insignificant in it. And I think, well, at least for me personally, I grew up seeing in everything around me, nature and the universe and the cosmos and the incredible, I don't know my place in all of it. Right. And then I see people walking around the world going, well, I hate you cause you're black. And I sit there right. and go, what? This doesn't make sense. Why? What? Yeah. Why, why would you even focus on this? It doesn't matter. Like, yeah. you're just star stuff, dude. Start acting like it, you know? So yeah, I think scientists, when you were saying earlier how astronomers are a certain way, I think scientists in general who understand the bigger picture of life in the universe, I think there's a... I don't know what the right words are. I'm fumbling a bit. And it, but I think there's a, a sadness because you see the, the universal perspective, not just the global one. And it's very hard to understand why people do some of the bad things they do, I think, when you feel that way, you know? Yeah, well, this is why, like, scientific literacy is just so important, because it's not about reading through a science textbook and thinking that's what science is. It's it's really like looking at each other and ourselves and our relationships with one another and our, our short, short time period here on Earth as as something that's just so much more fragile, but also at the same time, it can be so much more strong than we treat, I guess, uh, our yeah, our way of life to be. We we treat each other sometimes, and we treat our systems and and our our thinking to be like this totally broken way. But that's not it at all. In fact, our bodies mm. are just mechanically structured to do everything for us. So we don't have to think about it. I mean, me moving my hands right now, I'm not thinking about it. It's just doing it, breathing, drinking water, seeing, and, and uh, my body's digesting food right now without me thinking about it. I don't have to focus on it. And, and it's like, my heart is pumping blood to everything that needs it. And, and so in a way we are these like very intricately built systems that, Every single human being has that beautiful ability. And, and I think that it's just so, um, it's so obvious for, I guess, those who, who, yeah, who like study kind of science and have this understanding and kind of just sort of see it so differently than, I guess, like um, others who just think I have no time for that, or I don't care about that or whatever it is. But it's, you know, there's just that 
that separation between the minds. Yeah, I mean, it was Carl Sagan who said, uh, we are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Yeah. And I don't think people realize how important of a statement that really is. Yeah. Man, well, we could talk about this for several podcasts, but I'm yeah. going to move on to other questions. I'm curious, uh, do you like science fiction? I do. Yeah. I grew up watching science fiction with my dad a lot. So I used to watch like Star Trek, the original series with him all the time. <laughs> nice. Absolutely love it. Um, and a lot of sci-fi B movies. I started getting into the actual like good sci-fi, so like Stargate, um, like a little bit later in my life, Space Odyssey. Um, uh, does it bother you when you're watching sci-fi though, and science is not represented correctly? Yeah, it does. At first, I used to like, when I was younger, I was like, you know, why do scientists always get so bothered if like the stars aren't aligned properly? And then I started really realizing the significance of how people think a lot of these things are real when they watch movies. Mm -hmm. people, a lot of people think like, oh, well, that's actually what it is. Like, this is how it's supposed to be. And and it's not that at all. And actually, we could be using these beautiful, well-filmed movies to also be educational for people, kind of like sub like subliminally in a sense. So I very much appreciate when like the, you know they they do it right, like the expanse, for instance. So my girlfriend's super into animals and nature. She's like the next David Attenborough, basically, incredibly <laughs> knowledgeable about uh, animals for real. And and really, I hope at some point has a show like the BBC Nature because she'd be an amazing host. But it really annoys her to no end when you're watching some TV show or movie and they will play animal sounds in the background, let's say from an Australian, a native Australian animal that only lives in the outback <laughs> and they're having it in like Michigan. Just so oh they can my have some, some sound designers like, just give me one of those cool animal sounds and we'll throw it in here. <gasps> so it annoys her because oh, she, wow. she'll pause the video and be like, that animal's not native to Michigan. It would never be, couldn't survive there. Blah, blah, blah. And you're like, can she like please start making videos about that? Because I actually had I was totally oblivious to this. I had no idea about that. And the fact that she can pick up animal sounds, my little sister is like that. She loves animals so much and she like because my dad essentially has like a zoo at his place. And so she picks up animal sounds and can tell the difference between like types of bird sounds. And it, that's incredible. It's a big talent. And they use the kookaburra all the time in Hollywood. <laughs> and it's an it's an Australian animal. So <sighs> You'll, you'll be on some planet. We're on Tepthos 3 and there's a kookaburra in the background. You're like, dude, just get more, you know, just invent a new sound, you know? Gosh, I'm going to be conscious of this now. <laughs> I'm curious if you could pick only one discovery that you want science to f absolutely fully make in your lifetime definitively, what would it be? Another civilization on an exoplanet. <laughs> Imagine like, cause so the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be launching soon, hopefully. And so a special thing about the telescope is being able to really peer into the atmospheres of exoplanets and like, you know, exploring so many of them, especially the TRAPPIST-1 system, which has three Earth-like planets within the habitable zone and seven total Earth-like planets. Imagine peering into that and then like, being able to see a whole civilization like that would just be that'd be insane. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Well, we touched on it a little bit, but if you had to describe kind of succinctly, why do you think science and science education are important? Well, for one, um, I think it's really just going to lead to better innovations, both like medically speaking for a lot of the just diseases we're, we're fighting today. A lot of the, the human ailments were, you know, kind of fragile as human beings. So I think science is really important with aiding in that type of like medical technology, but also to just, as we mentioned earlier, this like mindset of who we really are, what, what, we, what we're doing and um, how to essentially like treat each other differently when it comes to like political systems, for instance, you know, the way that we set up economies, the way we set up civilizations and industry and um, especially industry because of everything happening with our planet, climate change mm -hmm. speaking. I think that having more scientific expression at a young age is just so brilliant and it people just i think start to grow in a way where we just see the world very differently um, for, in a much better more positive way and people then grow up to become like entrepreneurs and inventors mm -hmm. for things that maybe today we, we think we don't need but there's so many things that we could use or that things we haven't even realized we, we need haven't it, realized you know? exactly that was exactly mm -hmm. what i was gonna say things we haven't realized yet that we needed and that's exactly it yeah uh if you had the power to pass legislation what's something you would put into play oh that's a really great question I'd probably want to pass like a really 
Are we speaking like budget wise? Uh, you have magic, magic like powers and you can just, whatever you want, you can just push magic through. Magic powers. Um, <laughs> I would say like a huge amount of money to be invested into companies that are coming up with new ways to essentially combat climate change. So like more in nuclear energy, more in clean energy, less in fossil fuel usage, less in oil make that like worth nothing, essentially make it worth like, as if it's just something that we don't need anymore, make us actually live in a society in a system where like what, what Elon did with Tesla, he created a product, put it out there. And by doing that, it's already changing so many people's perspective of how clean energy works when it comes to vehicles. And now there's like New York yeah. city buses that are electric, total zero emissions. Like it's incredible. And so I think that, um, putting a huge investment in startups in entrepreneurs coming up with their ideas and, and being able to have funding for that, because that's where I think a lot of the innovation is going to happen. Um, and a lot of the change. Have you ever seen that funny meme that says it's really a shame that there's not one gigantic, unbelievably renewable source of energy floating in the sky that costs zero to use or whatever. It's, yes. You know, well, if we were to learn how to harness the energy of the sun, seriously, we would reach a type one civilization. We're not going to get into the Fermi paradox right now. We can totally do that all the time. But like, <laughs> that's essentially reaching a type one civilization of being able to harm the energy of our star. Yeah, I agree. And, and yeah. I think we're totally headed there. I think since my childhood till today, see, this is the thing, Athena, people don't look at change on a global scale and a, and a geologic scale. They look at it as a scale of last week to today, Yeah, you know, for, for every issue from from science to racism to love, like people just kind of look at what happened to them a month ago and not today. And so when you look back, even myself over almost 50 years, and I see the amount of change we've been through, that's positive. 99% I mean, of it's been positive, you know, it's to me, it's inspiring that we're making such progress. Um, and that's a whole other, another whole podcast, but I think we are heading towards type one and I think we'll get there in the next thousand years, if not less. Yeah. I think so too. Yeah, that would just be, yeah. On the fun note, your your online handle is Astrophysicist Barbie, and I think I sent you the link. Do you actually have the <gasps> Astrophysicist Barbie doll? I do. Wait, let me grab her. I totally forgot to pull her out for the show. <laughs> I have her. Oh my god, that's so awesome! <laughs> and it's, I grab my sweater because I literally am her. That is <laughs> so, so funny. funny, dude! I'm gonna take a screen cap of that for your episode. Yes, make sure we don't forget. So, speaking of Barbie and being a woman, have you had any difficulties or pushback as a woman and a model working in science? So, while I was actually working in science, uh, I was doing my research, I personally did not really experience that that much. But I was, you know, I wasn't college I was doing undergraduate research so for for that it was it was actually pretty pretty positive I had really good peers um but on the social media side of things like yeah I mean there's there's a lot on the internet I think when it just comes to like people behind their screens wanting to say a lot of things so I did experience a lot of pushback with that especially when I was starting there was several times I wanted to just stop because I was making YouTube videos was really shy on camera was like kind of slurring my words together wasn't really good at really presenting and because of you just googled my name back then it was like all my modeling pictures that like when I had first started people would find me and it was just hate comment after hate comment the hate comment just literally saying what are you doing like take this video down like why are you talking about space like you're a model like this is stupid like who are you and I mean it was just on and on and on and, and um and it did keep going but I just I believed in me. I had friends that believed in me and my family believed in me and like to just keep doing it. And like, especially my, my mentor, Dr. Charles Liu was like one who really was telling me, he's like, you know, you're exactly what's needed right now is this hundred percent actual like hybrid between like the fashion industry and the science industry. And like, you know, that's breaking the status quo. Like you don't have to be one or the other at all. Like, and and the fact that you've pursued both and you are pursuing both, that's, that's important. So it's going to be uncomfortable and there's going to be like, you know, I guess a battle when it comes to the things to face online, but it's, you know, really worth in the end. So I try not to get like too. Well, wait, if we, if we can just, if we can just be blunt for one second, for many, many years, I think it was hard for people to believe that anyone who was super hot could be smart. Yeah. I don't really know why. If people would put their negative energy into positive energy, what an amazing world we'd have, you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that at least that because more people are sort of having this mentality of exactly what you just expressed is why we're seeing, I think, so much, um, just like I think a lot of 
beautiful change with with kids and the youth. Like that's why that's become such a big passion in my heart. Like where I'm at in my career is like I'm teaching an astronomy class now at a school, and like I absolutely love it because there's so many younger girls that I honestly had no idea that I was, I guess I like, like inspirational to them. Like I like didn't really like think that me just kind of being me is really important for, for them and to kind of like just pursue it. And I was like, wow. Yeah. I, I didn't really like think about that before that, you know, it just, it's something that's really important. So I think that um, we're starting now to see that. And the reason why that's so valuable is because you're going to start to see now, like just more innovators at a younger age from all walks of life, all backgrounds, all looks, all everything that are now creating their own things. Like, I mean, that's the whole point of life is to build and to create. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think there was a point where like bring up the stereotypes that you mentioned where that wasn't really the thing. We kind of left it to everybody else. We we're like, Oh, there's only like certain people that do that, you know, and, and everybody else, like you're kind of just supposed to follow. That's not true at all. And we kind of see that, especially the internet opened this whole world of freelancers, of entrepreneurs, of people being able to balance like several jobs at the same time and and fuel not only creativity, but innovation in a different way than what we're used to, because we don't just have to rely really necessarily on a specific corporate job and say that that's exactly what it is, building someone else's dream. Now people get to build their own dreams because of all these platforms mm-hmm. online. And I don't just mean social media. I mean, like, you know, kids learning how to code at eight years old, um, like at the school that I teach at, like they're using scratch programming, which is something developed by MIT, you know, and there's so many incredible free online open sources now. People can learn this stuff. Well, speaking of that, let's talk about STEM for a minute. For listeners who don't know, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it is a broad term used to group these disciplines of academia together. Uh, If you had one message for young people out there who are interested in STEM, uh, what would you say to them? I would say, obviously do it and get involved. You know, I would say like, try to find a club at your school or um, a mentor or people that are maybe doing what you might want to possibly pursue one day. Um, if you're interested in STEM and even STEAM, which would be like putting the A in there for art, definitely like explore NASA's website, for instance. NASA works with graphic designers and artists all the time and photographers and anybody who's doing creative arts as well to enhance like images taken of space and to develop things. Mm. So I would say definitely uh, pursue it. Look for internships and museums, volunteer at museums. Yeah, definitely. That was something that changed my world. And that's what made me realize I wanted to go into science communication, that I actually could do it was volunteering at the Intrepid out here in New York for for two years because I got to really test what it's like to talk in front of a crowd and talk, you know, talk science. And that's why I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it. So. Athena, I'm curious, what is the most valuable, what, what are the most valuable insights you think you've learned from your multiple careers so far? I would say is that um, everybody is so much more complex and interested in a variety of things than a lot of us think we are. Um, I think that we kind of have this ide- ideology of like kind of the box mentality that like you're in your box, I'm in my box, we're all in our own boxes of interest. But what really is happening is there's this like web that's happening. Like really what makes up humanity is that there's such a cross interest of curriculums and passions that humanity is made up of. And the more that we start to kind of recognize that, the more we really can become, I think, more understanding and connected to each other of our similarities and to actually like love our differences. Because that's what is, I think, the biggest lesson um, as humanity is like we have a great opportunity here to learn from one another and have different perspectives, which is why more diversity is important, especially in scientific development, because you have these different mindsets of like, say, kind of maybe having like, you know, a female scientist or having someone who, um, I don't know, has like a different background in religion or, or someone who has like some passion for something else or someone who's part of like the LGBTQ community. I think that that's something that we really should be pushing more because these differences of how humanity has migrated around the planet is what I think is really going to bring us to like a whole new level of evolution. I agree a hundred percent. Speaking of being around the planet, you've traveled uh, a bit for modeling in your career. I'm just curious, where's your favorite uh, country you've been to outside the U S I really, really love South Korea. For a while, I was considering it to be my second home because I was just like flying out there a lot for modeling. But it was 
kind of despite sort of the, the plastic surgery aspect of the obsession in Seoul currently, the kind of fundamental like background culture and how it developed and the foods and kind of also too, I went to the demilitarized zone for a bit and learned a bit about kind of the North and South Korea situation of what's going on and what's been happening for, for a while now is I think really interesting. And so it, it, I think it really tied a lot also into kind of like the respectfulness that I experienced while I was there. And then, yeah, the families and the way, you know, you kind of just like look out for your parents, all my friends, just like that, that like live out there, just like, you know, caring for like the elderly and their family and their parents. And I just, I really love that about sort of what I experienced out there. Um, in addition to all, all the technology and innovations and there's super fast trains and really tall buildings, which yeah. is really cool, but really kind of that like core humanness I really enjoyed. That's really cool. Is there somewhere that you haven't traveled yet that you really want to go? Yeah, I really want to go to South Africa um, and New Zealand. I've always wanted to visit um, Cape Town and then um, and New Zealand is, is somewhere I've just really, for so long, I've had so many dreams, recurring dreams about areas um, in New Zealand that I've seen images of much later in my life. And I was like, hey, I used to dream of this place all the time. I think I should go there. So yeah, definitely. We, go. we went there for our 10 year anniversary. Oh, wow. Super, like, like a lot of nature, right? Like supernatural. Oh, and, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of the places on the earth I could easily move and be happy for the rest of my life. It's wow. absolutely beautiful. The people are super nice. Um, just can't say enough good things about New Zealand. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. Yeah. Well, hey, if you weren't a space loving educator and a model, what would you be? A rocket. <laughs> I awesome. absolutely. Yeah. Dance was my number one love. Uh, I started dancing on a stage at age three. Um, I've always loved theater. I did competitive dance, ballet, mainly ballet. Ballet was really like my passion. And, and I went into training for the Rockettes for a while. Um, I got to be a stand-in for, for them once, um, which was really exciting for a pre-lit shoot for their Christmas campaign. And that was kind of enough for me to sort of check that off the bucket list, I would say. <laughs> we have to write some kind of really cool space education thing that involves a dance number and then have you choreograph and shoot it. That would be amazing. I would love to do that. That's a great <laughs> idea. I'm going to write that down. I like that. Yeah. You're welcome. I'll happily fly there and shoot it for you. Yeah. Um, well, you look, overall, you are you are obviously a very incredibly passionate, happy, and inspiring person. Uh, everyone has downtime or tough days. And I'm curious, what do you like then? Like, what do you do when you have a bad day? definitely meditate. Um, sometimes I can meditate for like two hours and do like deep stretches, like yoga I'll try to do, but like really kind of stretching is just what really gets me to slow down and just sort of like try to heal myself, I guess, like emotionally and like healing from having a bad day. But definitely I would say like doing meditations and stretching and like playing like Tibetan singing bowls and lighting an incense and you know, like having a humidifier going, <laughs> like doing the whole like ohm type of situation. See, that, yours is very complicated. It involves a lot of stuff. Mine is just a pint of Ben and Jerry's and some Netflix. A pint of Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> I, I feel worse when I do that. It's just... Not for the first 20 minutes, you don't. No, this is true. The first 20 minutes, you're like, oh, this is great. And then you're like, okay, no. Yeah, no, I just really try to turn like just like inside and turn off the whole world. Like if I'm having a bad day, Athena Brensberger, what would be the title of your autobiography? Keep learning. I don't know. <laughs> I used to always, so I, when I used to write that on my Instagram. It was always like hashtag keep learning because like ever since I left university, I've just continually done just schooling on my own online, do like various courses and I'm constantly learning things because that's the whole point of life. You don't just stop when you leave school and stick to the same thing, you know, you should always constantly improve. Agreed. What was your favorite childhood book? Tobias Turkey. <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> it's about that? a turkey. It's kind of terrible because I'm vegan now. So I would be like, this is so bad. But it's about a uh, it's really skinny, skinny turkey who um, is essentially like laughed upon by all the other turkeys because he's too skinny for Thanksgiving. And all the other turkeys are super fat and plump and it's like really admired and they're all getting turkey awards. And Tobias <laughs> is like this scrawny guy who just hasn't hit, I guess, like his peak yet where he's put on weight. And when I was little, I saw like a stage production of this and was like absolutely like in tears, like crying because I felt so bad for him. But he persevered and had determination. And at like five or six years old, I learned those words is, is determination and perseverance and to just like keep believing in yourself and push through. And eventually he trained every single day to like get himself up to what he wanted to be. And he proved like, kind of like himself to, yeah, he proved everybody wrong and also just proved to himself that he could do it. 
if he set his mind to it. And, um, and, and I just he was so it. skinny. He didn't hit the chopping block for years and that years. That was so years. terrible. I was like, <laughs> I like was talking about my mom the other day and I'm like, wait, wait, he was literally fatting himself up to get eat for Thanksgiving. This is so bad. Um, but it was one of my favorite books because he learned about perseverance, like all that stuff. But um, yeah. Device turkey. This is a major detour, which I'm not sure we should take, but let's do it. <laughs> I was really excited to find out that bio meat is actually something that they're working very hard on and they've come to major breakthroughs on. Uh, and eventually, I believe, not only in our lifetime, but very soon, I think that the face of, of meat production, as we know it, is going to drastically change and that we will start growing meat in a lab based on cell cultures and whatnot, and we will not have to actually kill animals anymore. And I am 100% in favor of this because I do enjoy meat, but I love animals and I can't stand the fact that an animal has to die so that I can have food on my plate. Uh, I'm curious what you think. Yeah. So I think it's really fascinating. I watched a documentary on this recently, um, and I think that it definitely is, is a positive way of, I think, like kind of moving forward with like meat consumption, just because it's, again, it doesn't harm the animal. A lot of them are tortured when they're killed. And so like, you, you know, you're minusing that whole aspect, but I think it might take a lot of trial and error before actually getting it to a point where it's, uh, we know it'll be healthy and consumable, but like, we don't know about long-term effects, I would say, right. um, of it. And like, you know, possible i don't think it would really mutate because we would digest through it but like we don't necessarily i think know what it'll kind of do to the body long term agreed and so i i do think that it's interesting and it's a really interesting route and that would be very useful especially when we become an interplanetary species and live on other planets as well um unless you plan to have a chicken farm on mars but you know that's going to cost a lot of money it's going to be very difficult because you're gonna have to get a lot of water for it and oxygen and you know humans mm -hmm. need that at the end of the day and so I think that this is a really good opportunity for, um, yeah, just moving forward in, in a yeah non-harmful way, I guess, for, for meat consumption. I really agree. And I really think we're actually heading towards the Star Trek replicator eventually, that you're just going to be able to go to a machine and, and get what you want. I think that's coming. It may not be in our lifetime, but it's coming. Yeah. And what's really funny about cost, though, is I was watching this guy talk about bio meat the other day, and he said, we're working on trying to make it viable because right now you know, this particular bio grown cheeseburger, which is a hundred percent, we think perfect costs $4,000 to make. And I was watching so the same a, thing. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, but it, it's coming, you know, it used to be, you know, what do they say? The original, the original of anything, the yeah. prototypes were so expensive and now they're commonplace. So, well, yeah. Like space flight. I mean, like Virgin Galactic right now, $250,000 to go, you know, just up a little bit above like the atmosphere and then come back down and be able to see earth. Um, but that's going to eventually come down in price. You know, I mean, you look at like aircraft and how expensive it was in the fifties. Yeah. We definitely see that price coming down the more that like, I think more companies start to open up. Um, and then more, yeah, like you said, more people are working on the prototype. Well, yeah. When you and I are old, Southwest airlines is going to have like friends fly free to the moon base. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's totally going to happen. Oh my gosh. It's going to be incredible. I was so excited. We're eating your bio meat for free on the plane. If you're in first class. Exactly. Like... <laughs> yeah. 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 That's funny. Uh, well, what was uh, the first movie you remember that made you cry? Oh, gosh, it's going to be so cheesy. The Notebook. I was so shocked that I was crying because I had never cried from a movie before. I was like, why am I so emotional from this movie? And it just was like, yeah, it, it just tore me up. I was I was a hot mess. So. <laughs> what do you do with your off hours? What are your hobbies? Work? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I paint. I love painting. And pre-COVID, I was dancing a lot, doing like ballet classes. Um, absolutely one of my favorites. It's really a hobby now. It's not a career anymore. So um, love that and painting. Yeah, and being outdoors, you know, hiking, being in nature, yeah. you know. Athena, it's 8 o'clock at night. You have the house to yourself and you're going to put on some music and dance like crazy. What song would you put on? What's your jam? Living on a Prayer by Bon Jovi. Yes! <laughs> Bon Jovi geek. I like, I'm obsessed with Bon Jovi. I actually just did a TikTok about some jeans I found when I met them in person for their album signing of the circle in New York. And I like made these jeans. I bleached myself and like wrote all their album titles on it. And I just made a TikTok of that the other day. It was like, wow, I haven't listened to Bon Jovi in forever, but definitely my, my happy music also going back to when I need to be in a good mood. I play Bon Jovi for some reason. If yoga's not helping me or whatever, for some reason, have a nice day just this sets sets me on a good mood 
Dude, Slippery When Wet is one of the best albums ever made in the history of time. So great. Yeah, I remember when it came out on Guitar Hero, too. Yeah, oh, dude, I saw the tour when I was in high school, and I was kind of in the, the back of the floor. And Bon Jovi did this thing where he like had a flying rig and he got up in the suit and then he flew across the audience and he landed. No, he landed on a platform right in front of me and our friends. And he like pointed at us and was singing to us. And I'm like 17 years old. It was the greatest thing in the world. I was like, you go, John. She's a little runaway. (laughs) Oh, that sounds amazing. Wow. I wish I was there for that. (laughs) Do you have a favorite food? Yeah. So before I was vegan, it was buffalo chicken wings. So now that I'm vegan, buffalo cauliflower, obsessive (laughs) buffalo cauliflower and samosas, those two. Athena, one of my favorite questions on the show that I kind of referenced earlier, if you could sit down for four hours in an old timey pub with one person from all of human history, alive or dead, but excluding your own family members or any kind of religious prophet, who would you sit down with? What would you drink? And what's the first question you would ask them? (sighs) Carl Sagan. Yes. And I would probably drink, debating if I'd want to have like a type of caffeine or like a type of wine. I feel like I'd probably go with like a glass of Merlot. And then I'd probably ask him, why? Why are we all here? Great question. Not that he'd have the actual answer, but his opinion. Well, if you ever get that answer, let me know. I will let you know. (laughs) If you could travel in time, where would you go and why? Oh, gosh. I would fast forward like 6,000 years and just kind of see what's what's popping, you know, like what's going Mm -hmm. on on Earth, hang out on Mars, go to, uh, yeah, Enceladus. Yeah, that's why. Just kind of see what's up. (laughs) What's up, future? How's it going? (laughs) What's your guilty TV pleasure? (gasps) Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I've rewatched that so many times. Do you know about it? Oh yeah, we well wait, don't tell me anything cuz we're only we're only about a season and a half in. Oh, okay. So we're, well, we're late we're late comers to the show. So Oh, it's so good. It's it's literally one of my favorites. I've rewatched it so many times. It's so good. Yeah. Love love Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. What superpower would you choose? I've always wanted to fly. I'm actually envious of flies because they could fly and I can't. And so probably I would say fly. Yeah. They also only live for like what, 48 <laughs> hours or whatever. <laughs> you you're just over here like, really, Athena? Like, you're envious of flies. Couldn't you choose like a hawk or, a, you know, something that lives a little like a fly? <laughs> a hawk. <laughs> oh, Peregrine God. falcon? They're the coolest animal on earth. No, just the fly. <laughs> uh, what quality do you admire most in human beings? Courage. Yeah, I think that like courage has really changed so much of our world for the better. And I think that that's something that just like is easily accessible to every human being within us. But we have to just really try to I think, find it. And once we do, it's like the outcome is just so phenomenal. If you could tell your younger self anything, you could jump back in time to like 12 year old Athena. What would you tell her? Um, I don't know. Like, yeah, just really go with the flow with things. Because every time things are right, they just kind of work the they they work out really well. Um, and don't don't like struggle to sort of hold on to things that aren't flowing, which sounds probably so cliche, but just looking at from age twelve to where I am now, things like for instance, my high school and my college I ended up getting into was just so such a weird random coincidence that um was all kind of by accident. And if I had like been really stubborn and like really like fought it, I wouldn't have ended up down the road of, you know, doing research for NASA and like going on to pursuing a modeling career. And so I would say like 12 year olds, like, Hey, anytime, like it feels like something is sort of just like pushing in a direction, just go with it. Don't try to fight it. Mm -hmm. Stay with the flow. Yeah. Do you believe in love? Yes, of course I do. Okay. (laughs) There you'd be surprised. Some people are like, not really. You know, <laughs> wow, yeah, no, it's gosh, you can love so easily. You can love a plant. I love my plants, I love my teddy bear. Like, it's such a powerful feeling when you actually just sort of like notice it. Athena, if heaven actually exists, and let's say you're allowed to come inside when you die, what would you want God to say to you the moment you guys meet? Welcome to the cosmos. Ooh, I like it. (laughs) Because imagine, like, imagine when you die, you actually are just now like one with the entire universe. You can feel and be inside of a nebula and be inside a black hole and a dying star all at the same time. 
yeah, if that happens, I'd just be great. But I will say, I imagine God standing there going, welcome to the cosmos. Yeah. And then I feel like fire should shoot off and it's the start of an awesome rock concert. Bon Jovi will be there playing. It's gonna be- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be so epic. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that would be great. So what's next for you? Oh, such a powerful question. I'm just like, duh. Um, okay, yeah. Both career-wise and spiritually, whatever you want to answer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. spiritually. Okay. So what's next for me? Um, so while working on my like new clothing collection that just came out and still creating a bunch of videos for like my YouTube channel, I plan to also go back to school to obtain my physics degree um, and probably do some more research um, in undergrad as you know, in astrophysics. So I want to actually uh, go ahead and, and go ahead and like finish that degree, start to do some more research, kind of kind of go on the back end a little bit, like not so much like on camera all the time and actually just start to sort of, yeah, really delve into um, doing what I started 10 years ago. So I, I would love to actually get back into that, into the swing of things. Um, and then eventually I have a family and, you know, I have kids and stuff like that. So yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Athena, the last thing we do on the show is a little game I have called 299 Philosophical and Life Questions with Moonbird. I have a list of 299 philosophical and life questions I've collected over the years from friends, family, and the internet. You get to pick two numbers from 1 to 299. I'm going to ask you those two random questions. You're welcome to pass if you want another one. What would be your two numbers? Five. Five. And... Okay, 11. Five and 11. All right, here we go. Number five, one of my favorite questions to ask on the show, actually. What is your favorite word? <gasps> word. Word is your favorite word? That's such a sad answer. <laughs> I, just, I that, say word all the time. No, no, no. Preposterous. 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 That is one of my Because I was going to say, if word, word is your favorite word, we're going to have to go with your second favorite word as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say preposterous. And it was from Tobias Turkey. I learned that word when I was like really young, six or seven years old. And I was like, preposterous. And it's when you're like, this is just preposterous. And it's just when something is absolutely like ridiculous. So. That's hilarious. Okay. That was number five. You said number 11. Yep. What is the best compliment you've ever received? I can tell you what it's going to be, actually. What? It's going to be, I really loved your interview on Memories of a Moonbird. <gasps> that is going to be my favorite compliment <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, it's definitely something that like my mentor has said to me um, just about like my like my way of connecting to people, uh, meeting them at their level when it comes to communicating science, because everybody learns at a different level. So yeah, it was it was a compliment from Dr. Charles Liu, my my astrophysics mentor, and uh, I still get to consider him my mentor today. And he said to me just how great of a job I do when it comes to like communicating science and connecting to people and meeting them where they're at. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just changed my world, rocked my world. <laughs> That's awesome. That's really awesome. Yeah. Maybe we'll get him on the show at some point. He is awesome. He should definitely be on the show. He is so cool. He studies like black hole collisions and like galactic evolutions. Really, really cool. Well, I'll speak to you about that offline. Yeah, (laughs) definitely. Athena Brensberger, thank you so much for being on the show. I wish you the best of luck with everything you're doing with Astro Athens and promoting such wonderful education for the world. So thank you. Yeah, it's such a great time chatting with you. So thank you for having me, Daniel. This was so awesome. Friends and listeners, if you'd like to learn more about Athena's amazing work with astronomy education, you can check her out on social media and her website at astroathens.com. That's A-S-T-R-O-A-T-H-E-N-S.com. And her social media handle is the same, at Astro Athens. A little fun fact for you before we go. The Earth is actually moving at approximately 67,000 miles per hour around the orbit of the sun. And so that means in in about the minute that it takes me to do this outro and ask you to please support the show we have all traveled almost 1200 miles together in space how cool is that While you're out there in outer space spinning around on this beautiful blue marble, why don't you support the show by heading over to patreon.com forward slash moonbird. Every dollar counts and helps us keep the lights on. And remember, if you want more moonbird in your life, and hey, who wouldn't? Head on over to memoriesofamoonbird.com or visit me on social media at memoriesofamoonbird. Buckle up, this earth is moving, and stay safe. Stay safe.